NIRF ranking released, IIT Madras tops in overall category, Miranda College tops among colleges. Twenty-second Law Commission recommended continuation of sedition law, said necessary for unity and integrity, suggested increase in punishment. Interesting report of University of Leeds on climate change. India may get compensation of $170 trillion. Developed countries will pay the fine. Possibility of salt cave-based strategic oil reserves in Rajasthan. Engineers India Limited is executing the work. Country's oil storage capacity may increase. And report released on global slavery. India has highest modern slavery in G20 group. Research done on 160 countries. Recently, the 22nd Law Commission recommended retaining the sedition law with procedural safeguards and enhanced jail term. In this regard, the Commission recommended three changes in the sedition law. First, adding words like with a tendency to incite violence or create public disorder in Section 124A based on the 1962 judgment in Kedarnath v. State of Bihar. Second, at present, Section 124A provides for a jail term of up to three years or life imprisonment. It could be changed to seven years or life imprisonment. Third, to prevent misuse of the law, the report suggests including a procedural safeguard that no FIR for sedition be registered until a police officer of the rank of inspector has conducted a preliminary inquiry and union or state government agreed with his report. Arguing in favor of the sedition law, the Commission said that it is necessary to protect the unity and integrity of India, as India is still affected by internal terrorism. The Commission also justified criminalizing sedition, saying it is a reasonable restriction under Article 19.2 of the Constitution. Significantly, last year, the Supreme Court had stayed the sedition law while hearing a case challenging the constitutional validity of Section 124A of the IPC. Also told the Centre that no new case should be registered under it till reconsideration. Recently, Kerala High Court has said that the depiction of the upper naked body of a woman cannot be termed as obscene or indecent. To this, the court remarked that nudity should not always be equated with sexuality. Whether or not there is obscenity can only be determined in context. In such a situation, no one should be held guilty under obscenity law for political artistic expression unless the context is wrong. The court made this comment on a video posted by a social worker, Rehana Fatima, on a social media platform in 2020. In this video, two of her minor children were seen painting on her half-naked body. After the controversy that arose after this video, various sections were imposed on Rehana. But the court believes that the purpose of the video was to hurt the prevailing female inequality and patriarchy in the society and not to spread obscenity. Let us tell you that like in many countries, obscenity is considered a crime in India too. For this, there is also a provision of punishment under sections 292, 293 and 294 of the IPC that is Indian Penal Code. However, it has not been clearly defined anywhere in the Indian law, nor has its scope been specified. Section 292 of the IPC and 67 of the IT Act have described those material as obscene which is sensuous or produces sensuality or which, on seeing, reading or hearing, produces sensuality. There is no clarity in the law as to what is considered sensual and sensuality. The right of its interpretation has been left to the court. If found guilty in any such case, the accused may be punished with a sentence of two years and a fine of 2,000 rupees. If he or she is found guilty in a similar case for the second time, the accused will have to pay 5,000 rupees as fine and five years in jail. Recently, a research by University of Leeds in England has shown that India has become entitled to compensation due to climate change. The report published in the journal Nature Sustainability states that India could receive compensation of 
1446 dollars per person by 2050 this amount is approximately rupees 1.19 lakh per capita annually or equivalent to 66% of india's gdp in 2018 According to the report low emitting countries like India could receive a total of 170 trillion dollars in compensation for meeting climate change targets by 2050 Researchers from the University of Leeds analyzed 168 countries to determine the historical responsibility of countries for excess carbon dioxide emissions In the report economically developed countries like America and Germany have been considered responsible for up to 90% of carbon emissions. The report claims that the global north will triple the carbon budget despite the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degree Celsius. Researchers have proposed an evidence-based compensation mechanism to eliminate this inequality while fixing responsibility for climate change on the global north. According to the proposal, five developed countries namely US, Germany, Russia, UK and Japan will pay an average of 131 trillion dollars while on the other hand developing countries India Indonesia Pakistan Nigeria and China will get an average of 102 trillion dollars as compensation or reparations On June 5th the 50th anniversary of the World Environment Day was celebrated all over the world during this the Netherlands and Cote d'Ivoire together organized a global conference Its theme was solution to plastic pollution. It was launched under the hashtag Beat Plastic Pollution campaign. In India too, many steps were taken dedicating this day to the environment. To mark the occasion, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and the Collaborative Labeling and Appliance Standards Program organized a conference on consumer-centric approaches to the e-cooking transition in New Delhi. The aim of the conference is to accelerate the deployment of energy efficient, clean and affordable e-cooking solutions in India. In India, the day was celebrated by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change with an emphasis on mission life. The concept of mission life that is lifestyle for environment was introduced by the Prime Minister at the COP26 World Leaders Summit held in Glasgow. As a part of mission life, a comprehensive and non-exhaustive list of 75 different life actions have been identified across seven themes save water save energy reduce waste reduce e-waste reducing single use plastics adopting sustainable food habits and adopting a healthier lifestyle the theme of this year's world environment day that is solution to plastic pollution is also one of the seven themes of mission life in 2018 when the world environment conference was organized under the chairmanship of india its theme was beat plastic pollution Under this India has imposed a complete ban on single use plastic from July 1st 2022. Let us tell you that World Environment Day is being celebrated since 1973 under the aegis of the United Nations Environment Development Program established in 1972. According to media reports the government is studying the possibilities of developing salt cave based strategic oil reserves in Rajasthan Engineers India Limited a government owned engineering consultancy firm is executing the work The aim of this study is to increase the strategic oil storage capacity of the country At present India has only 3 strategic oil reserves These stores are located in Bengaluru and Padur in Karnataka and Visakhapatnam in Andhra Pradesh If this study gives promising results India may get its first salt cave oil reserve Let us tell you that the construction of strategic crude oil storage facilities in India is managed by the Indian Strategic Petroleum Reserve Limited under the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. India, which is the world's third largest oil importer, has a total fuel storage capacity of only 5.33 million metric tons. With this, only the demand of 9.5 days can be fulfilled. In such a situation if any kind of obstruction arises in the supply chain then India may have to face difficulties in view of this this study is being considered important actually salt caves are those underground places which are made by dissolving salt in water in this matter water is pumped over large areas of salt deposits to dissolve the salt and form caves these caves can be used to store crude oil once the salt dissolved in the water called brine is removed but india lacks the necessary technical expertise for this it is also difficult to identify suitable sites for salt based cave storage facilities in addition estimating the project cost is also a challenge until the technology and know how needed to build 
salt based caves storage facilities is acquired US Defense Secretary Austin who is visiting India met Defense Minister Rajnath Singh in this bilateral meeting with the Defense Minister he prepared a road map for defense cooperation in the next 5 years In the meeting the US has given its not for air warfare intelligence gathering co-production of equipment for surveillance and reconnaissance technology sharing and defense industrial cooperation During this both the countries also agreed to explore ways to build resilient supply chains Also both sides agreed to launch the India US Defence Acceleration Ecosystem Initiative. This initiative will be started for cooperation in advanced state of the art technology. In fact, according to the CIPRI report, India is the world largest arms importer and America is the largest exporter. However, Russia accounts for the largest share of India's arms imports which is around 60%. America wants to change this situation by preparing a defense road map with India. Till now, America has been opposing India's initiative to promote domestic industries in the defense sector, but now there is a change in America's attitude. China's increasingly aggressive policy in the Indo-Pacific region and India's rapidly growing economy have made America a close ally of India. Today, both the countries have bilateral relations on many major issues ranging from trade to cybersecurity, technology, defense. At the same time in multilateral fora like Quad, I2, U2, G20, both the countries share the stage with each other and confirm their deepening relations. After this meeting, the speculation of a big defense deal has intensified during the Indian Prime Minister's visit to America. Let us tell you that US defense trade with India has increased from almost zero in 2008 to more than 20 billion dollars in 2020 Recently the global slavery index was released by the Walk Free organization 160 countries were included in this index North Korea tops the overall ranking in the list on the other hand if we talk about India then India is at the 8th position in the Asia Pacific category Significantly this index shows the slavery of humans in any form around the world Walk Free uses data released last year by itself, the International Labour Organization and the International Organization for Migration to release its Global Slavery Index. According to this, the G20 group is contributing more to the growth of modern slavery as their business operations and global supply chains fuel human rights abuses. India tops the list with 11 million people working as bonded labourers among G20 countries. According to the report the number of people living in slavery in India has increased by about 25% in the last 5 years. According to the report today around 50 million people are living the life of modern slavery globally. Modern slavery includes practices such as forced labor, marriage against the will, debt bondage, commercial sexual exploitation, human trafficking, slavery and the sale and exploitation of children. Any situation where humans are made to do any work by means of threat, violence coercion and deception all come under the purview of this slavery in the past three cheetahs that came to india from namibia and south africa died since then questions being raised on the conservation of cheetahs in view of these deaths the central government has constituted a committee in this regard the center constituted an 11 member high level steering committee to review and monitor the progress of the cheetah rehabilitation project This committee has recommended not to install fencing for the protection of cheetahs in India. For the conservation of cheetahs, experts in South Africa and Namibia have recommended fencing around their habitats to reduce poaching, habitat fragmentation and man-animal conflicts. Their suggestion is to put up just two or three fences to protect the cheetahs and create a source reserve to top up the sink reserve. Let us tell you that the source reserves are those habitats which provide optimum conditions for the reproduction of a particular species these areas have abundant resources and favorable environmental conditions they support self sustaining populations and produce a surplus which can then be spread to other areas on the other hand sink reserves are places that have limited resources or environmental conditions that are less favorable for the survival or reproduction of a species sink reserves depend on source reserves to maintain their population numbers However the high level committee set up to oversee India's cheetah rehabilitation project says the fencing goes against basic principles of wildlife conservation in addition the committee says that fencing can disrupt the natural movements of animals and hinder genetic exchange between populations
Ministry of Education released its 8th NIRF that is National Institutional Ranking Framework ranking. In the overall category, IIT Madras topped for the 5th consecutive year. In the university category, the first position was backed by Indian Institute of Science Bangalore and second by JNU. Whereas Miranda College and Hindu College stood first and second respectively in the college category. The Indian Agricultural Research Institute New Delhi and IIT Kanpur have bagged the first position in the two new categories agriculture and allied sector and innovation respectively notably only 3565 higher educational institutions participated in the NIRF rankings that began in 2016 but in 2023 this figure has increased to 8686 Earlier the Ministry of Education used to release this ranking in only four categories but now its number has increased to 5 with eight discipline verticals These categories are overall national ranking university college research and innovation The eight discipline streams are engineering medicine management pharmacy law architecture dentistry and agriculture and allied fields Agriculture and allied sectors and innovation have been added to the ranking this year Higher educational institutions are assessed on five parameters to decide the ranking. These are teaching, learning and resources, research and professional practice, graduation outcomes, outreach and inclusion and peer perception. If we take a closer look at the NIRF rankings, we find that the overall category is dominated by institutions of national importance established by an act of parliament. Of the 100 institutes in the overall category, 36 are IITs and NITs. At the same time there are 26 state universities and 7 central universities but not a single private institute was successful in making its place in the top 10 Recently the Union Ministry of Power and New and Renewable Energy announced to launch Mahir that is Mission on Advanced and High Impact Research it aims to identify emerging technologies in the power sector also to be developed indigenously on a large scale for use within or outside the country Let us tell you that this mission will be launched jointly by the Ministry of Power and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Also this mission will be funded by pooling the financial resources of these two ministries and central public sector enterprises. Apart from this the financial requirement will be met from the budgetary resources of the government of India. Its duration has been kept from 2023-24 to 2027-28. The mission will have a two-tier structure comprising a technical scoping committee and an apex committee. The technical scoping committee will be chaired by the head of the Central Electricity Authority. The committee will survey and identify ongoing research and emerging areas globally. Along with this, the apex committee will also give its recommendations in this regard. The scoping committee will also identify potential technologies that can be considered for development under the mission. The Apex Committee will be headed by the Union Minister for Power and New and Renewable Energy. This committee will deliberate on the technology and products to be developed. It will also approve research proposals. The Apex Committee will also work on international cooperation. Final approval of all research proposals and projects will be done by the Apex Committee. Eight thrust areas have been identified for research under the mission. These areas include alternatives to lithium ion storage batteries, electric cookers or pans suited to Indian cooking methods, high efficiency fuel cells, carbon sequestration, geothermal energy. Apart from this, solid state refrigeration nanotechnology for electric vehicle batteries and indigenous cold rolled grain oriented technology are included. Recently the Data Security Council of India has published a report titled Bridging the Gap Identifying Challenges in Cyber Security Skilling and Bridging the Divide. According to the report Phishing, Smishing and Wishing are the top 3 cyber attacks that are expected to increase the most in the future. After that ransomware and zero day exploits can be expected to increase. The top 3 catalysts that could drive the demand for cyber security are First, the increasing use of artificial intelligence, machine learning and internet of things by hackers. Second, rising regulatory liabilities and third is the ever increasing use of digital platforms that are making data public on a large scale. These findings from the report suggest that there is a huge need for cyber security professionals in the country today. However, the report also reveals that such professionals are very few in corporates and cyber security professionals in more than 47% of corporates constitute only 5% of the total workforce. The objective of this report is to analyze the demand and supply of skilled cyber security professionals in India. 
identify the technical and social factors contributing to the shortage of skilled professionals. Along with this, solutions had to be found to address these differences through corporate social responsibility and a multi-stakeholder approach so that whatever deficiencies exist, that could be removed. Let us tell you that DSCI is a non-profit organization on data security setup formed by NASCOM in 2008. It aims to make cyberspace safe and secure by setting best practices, standards and initiatives in cybersecurity and privacy. On June 7, on the occasion of World Food Safety Day, the Union Minister of Health and Family Welfare released the fifth State Food Safety Index. The index evaluates the performance of states and union territories on different parameters of food security. Kerala has topped the index among larger states. It is followed by Punjab and Tamil Nadu. Goa has the top position among the small states. It is followed by the ranking of Manipur and Sikkim. Among union territories, Jammu and Kashmir, Delhi and Chandigarh have secured the first, second and third positions respectively. During the program, the Union Health Minister has announced to train 25 lakh food business operators in the next three years to meet the food quality standards. Apart from this, it has also been announced to set up 100 food streets across the country, which will work to meet quality benchmarks for food safety, hygiene and nutrition. During the event, FSSAI unveiled the RAFT that is Rapid Food Testing Kit Portal. The objective of this portal is to promote paperless working of RAFT scheme. Actually, this scheme was launched in 2019 to adopt modern technologies for food testing, screening and surveillance. Let us tell you that the State Food Safety Index was started by FSSAI in the year 2018-19. It aims to measure the performance of states on various parameters of food security along with ensuring safe and nutritious food for the people. Six parameters are included in this index. These standards include human resource and institutional data, compliance, food testing infrastructure and training and capacity building. Apart from this, consumer empowerment and improvement in the state food security index are included. Let us now look at the five questions based on the bulletin. Questions for this series are, first question is, Consider the following statements. 1. Ministry of Education released its 8th National Institutional Ranking Framework Rankings. 2. In the overall category, IIT Madras topped for the 4th year in a row. 3. In the university category, the first position was backed by Indian Institute of Science Bengaluru and second by JNU. How many of the above statements are correct? Only one, only two, all three or none. Next question is, consider the following statements. Statement 1. India and the US agreed to launch India-US Defense Acceleration Ecosystem Initiative. Statement 2. The objective of this initiative is to promote cooperation in advanced state of the art technology. Which of the following is correct about the above statements? Both statements 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. Both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is not the correct explanation of statement 1. Statement 1 is correct and Statement 2 is incorrect or Statement 1 is incorrect while Statement 2 is correct. Next question is consider the following statements. 1. On June 5, the 51st World Environment Day was celebrated all over the world. 2. During this, Ireland and Cote d'Ivoire together organized a global conference. 3. This year's theme was Solution to Plastic Pollution. How many of the above statements are correct? Only one, only two, all three or none. Next question is consider the following statements. Statement 1. Three cheetahs that came to India from Namibia and South Africa have died. For this, the committee constituted by the center has recommended not to build fences for the protection of cheetahs in India. Statement 2. The committee believes that fencing is against the basic principles of wildlife conservation. Which of the following is correct? Both Statement 1 and Statement 2 are correct and Statement 2 is the correct explanation of Statement 1. Both Statement 1 and Statement 2 are correct and Statement 2 is not the correct explanation of Statement 1. Statement 1 is correct, Statement 2 is incorrect or Statement 1 is incorrect and Statement 2 is correct. Last question is consider the following statements. Statement 1. Recently, the Data Security Council of India has published a report titled Bridging the Gap, Identifying Challenges in Cybersecurity, Skilling and Bridging the Divide. 
Statement 2 in this report cyber attacks like phishing, smishing and wishing are expected to increase the most in the future. Which of the following is correct? Both statement 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. Both statement 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is not the correct explanation of statement 1. Statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect or statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct. Punjab and Himachal Pradesh are once again face to face over the Shannon hydroelectric project. Actually, this hydroelectric project is in Mandi district of Himachal Pradesh state, but its operation is under the Punjab government. This is happening on the basis of an agreement made in 1925 between Joginder Sen, the then ruler of Mandi state and Colonel B.C. Bhakti, the British representative. At that time, under the agreement, the Mandi ruler had given his hydroelectric project on lease for 99 years. Now, because this lease is going to expire in 2024, the Himachal Pradesh government is claiming it while Punjab is against it. Let us tell you that the operation of this 110 megawatt project started in the year 1932. On World Tobacco Day, May 31, 2023, the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights launched the Nasha Mukta Amrit Kal campaign. The aim of this campaign is to promote a healthy and drug-free India. The program has been launched with the technical support of National Commission for Protection of Child Rights and Tobacco Free India, a citizens group. Under this, the children of the country will be made aware about the ill effects of tobacco and drugs. NCPCR, that is National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, is a statutory body under the Ministry of Women and Child Development. It was formed in 2007 under the Protection of Child Rights Act 2005. A cultural festival was organized in Paramaribo, Suriname to mark 150 years of the arrival of Indians in Suriname. Indian President Draupadi Murmu was awarded Suriname's highest honor, Grand Order of the Chain of the Yellow Star, on the occasion. She is the first Indian president to receive this honor. Significantly, in the year 1873, relations between India and Suriname started. The current president of Suriname, Chandrika Prasad Santokhi, is of Indian origin. He was the special guest of the 17th Pravasi Bharatiya Divas organized in Indore in 2023. Recently, the Nyai Vikas portal was launched by the Ministry of Law and Justice. The objective of this portal is to monitor the infrastructure projects built under Nyai Vikas. The portal will provide stakeholders seamless access to information related to funding, documentation, project monitoring and approvals. This centrally sponsored scheme is being run by the Department of Justice under the Ministry of Law and Justice since 1993-94 for the development of basic facilities for the districts and subordinate judiciary. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs chaired by the Prime Minister has decided to continue the coal and lignite exploration scheme from 2021-22 to 2025-26. An allocation of Rs 2,980 crore will be made for this. It is a central scheme which was started in 1989. It is being operated through Mineral Exploration Corporation, Geological Survey of India and Central Mine Planning and Design Institute. RBI recently unveiled a new financial inclusion dashboard called Antardrishti. The dashboard aims to provide valuable insights and track the progress of financial inclusion by capturing relevant data. This initiative has been launched to promote financial inclusion through a collaborative approach involving multiple stakeholders. Its biggest feature is that it will assess financial inclusion at the grassroots level. By identifying areas with low financial inclusion, policymakers can focus on implementing targeted measures to address the gaps and promote greater financial inclusion. As of now, it is launched only for internal use of RBI. Recently, the World Bank released the Global Economic Prospects Report. The report states that in 2023, the world economy may decline by 2.1%. In the report, the World Bank has reduced India's GDP growth rate for the financial year 2023-24 from 6.6% to 6.3%. For this decline, high inflation rate and decrease in private consumption have been attributed. However, the report assumes that the unemployment rate is declining. By the way, the GDP growth rate can also increase with the efforts of the government. Let us tell you that this report is released by the World Bank twice a year. 
Recently, the committee constituted by RBI has suggested to consider giving insurance coverage under the Deposit Insurance and Credit Guarantee Corporation to prepaid payment instruments also. The committee was constituted in May 2022 under the chairmanship of BP Kanungo, former Deputy Governor of RBI. It has recommended that RBI should think about its extension to both bank PPIs and non-bank PPIs. This will not only improve customer service but also strengthen customer protection efforts. We should tell you that RBI defines PPI as an instrument of payment that facilitates the purchase of goods and services. PPIs are in the form of payment wallets like Paytm wallet, Amazon Pay wallet, Phone Pay wallet, etc. Smart cards, mobile wallets, magnetic chips, vouchers, etc.